Hey, let's stand up. We started to learn this song last week. Jamie's going to lead us. I want you to join in. bless your name. We bless your name from the beginning of the day to the end of the day. Only your name is worthy of praise. I pray that tonight you will help us to worship you in a way that you are worthy of. We want you to have our hearts, Lord Jesus. We want you to have our hearts tonight. God, help us as we study your word to have hearts that are open to you. And Lord, I pray you'll teach us and lead us tonight. Direct us. Help us to follow you. Be obedient to you. Help us to worship you with all that we are. Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing this together. He became sin, who knew no sin, that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself.
it to him again yesterday. Yesterday, today, forever, you're the same. This is why. It's who he is. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you'll always be. Sing that. We have peace in It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you'll always be. It's who you'll always be. Sing it one more time to the Lord. It's who you'll always be. It's who you'll always be. Paul writes and tells us, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in wisdom and prudence. His riches that he's bestowed upon us. Let's pray. Lord, as we come to this time of offering, may we be mindful that it is because of grace that we give. Because of the abundance of your grace that you have poured out upon us, that we render unto you everything. We give our lives to you. We give our income to you. We give everything about ourselves unto you, fully yielded unto you tonight because of your grace, because you have so lavishly poured out upon us something that we did not deserve. And you have laid up for us an inheritance in heaven. May we give with a grateful, overflowing heart in Jesus' name. out the skies like a canyon who has scooped up the oceans with his hand who has measured the hills from the Beauty for us. 
Sing out with us, everlasting. Come on. Let your word consume our hearts tonight. Let your spirit invade our hearts tonight. I pray that you would change us, Lord Jesus. Conform us to your image. We love you. We worship you. You are worthy of praise. You're worthy of our lives, worthy of our surrender tonight. Draw us to you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. got your Bibles, uh, we're going to go to the book of Titus, and uh, I want to preach tonight on the subject of having an understanding of grace. 
Before we get into the Word, um, this week I was at a meeting with other metro churches like this and for executive pastors, and um, there was about, oh, close to 45 of us in the room, and the subject of Sunday night worship came up, and somebody said, well, hey, how many of you guys, your churches still do Sunday night worship? And there were five of us that still did Sunday night worship. And the next question was, well, of the five of you, how many of you, uh, your pastor preaches the same message that he preached on Sunday morning? They used to have the same service. Well, that was three of the five. And they looked at me and the other guy and said, so your pastor, unbelievably, they they asked, he does, he prepares two messages on Sunday. I emailed the pastor and told him that, and of course, uh, you know, his response was, you know, I didn't know we weren't supposed to be doing two messages on Sunday. So, uh, so we're kind of a unique church in this day and age of, of doing Sunday night worship. A lot of churches have gone away from that. A lot of churches that do it, um, they'll, they'll just have, this will be just another service they have, just like the ones in the morning service, just a, a third service. And so count yourself blessed to, uh, to have a different service and to have a Sunday night service because this is a real blessing uh, for us to continue to do this and, uh, and have this. Of course, this was not always the case. You know, churches for centuries didn't have church at night, and the reason was they, they didn't have electricity. They'd have one service on Sunday, and when electricity was invented, we said, well, hey, we can do this twice. We can do it at night, too. And so this is really kind of a recent phenomenon, and now we've kind of changed that, and churches are going away from it. And I think that's um, unfortunate in this day and age that, uh, that, that we're no longer having Sunday night service. I'm glad you're here tonight, so be encouraged, and thank you for coming. Titus chapter 2 and verse 11, having an understanding of grace. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, all people, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. I want to stop right there. Grace. As we go back to verse 11 and we begin to look at that, we, we begin to break that verse down. We see the, the word appeared, the, that grace appeared. That word, we get our word epiphany from it. It is a epiphaneo, and it means a sudden appearance. And you understand when Christ came into the world, the world had no understanding of grace. It did not expect it. It did not operate by it. Grace was a foreign concept, as John tells us in John 1.17. The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. He brought grace into a world that had no grace. And suddenly, grace appeared. You know, when things appear suddenly, it often changes our lives. I think of the very placid, peaceful morning of December the 7th, 1941, when all of a sudden, what was unimaginable to the United States military that bombers and fighters that from the Empire of Japan would come roaring over the mountains and begin to attack Hickam Field and Ford Island and dropping torpedoes into the water there at Pearl Harbor. It changed our country. It changed the trajectory of our nation. Our nation would go from an agrarian society, a, a very um, traditional society, to the one that becomes a manufacturing society, and one that would become, become the leader of the free world for decades because of the appearing of those aircraft with the rising sun on the side of them. Think of when that storm appeared out in the Atlantic. And when we first heard the name Ivan, not knowing where it was going to go, and it came toward the Gulf, and almost like a, like a drunk with a gun, it began to, we didn't know if it was going to Apalachicola or to New Orleans, and it just slowly began to center right there on us. And it changed our lives. When things appear, they, they change our lives. The first time 
Remember the first time you ever heard the term AIDS? How it appeared in Africa and made the jump from primates into, into humans and how it has changed our, our world. When the oil from the deep water horizon began to appear on the white sandy beaches of Pensacola, that changed a lot of things. Appearances that are sudden often change things. And when the grace of the Lord Jesus appeared, that changed the world. Because it opened the door to salvation that was not open before. Because of our sinfulness and Christ coming into our world, God was saying, now salvation is for all people, for everyone. Now, this is not just for a select few, because the Bible tells us in 2 Peter 3, 9, that it is God's desire that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So when we see inclusive language in the Bible, when Jesus talks about how he has come to die for all the world, and that anyone who believes in him, that you can take that language and you can count it as truthfulness. There's no trying to unravel a mystery. Well, is he saying just for, for a select few or is it just everyone that he chooses? It's for all people, for everyone who calls on the name of Christ. The appearance of grace came into our lives. This was God's intentional act to bring salvation to a, a lost world a hostile world, a world that had no desire to have God in their thoughts and imagination. And yet God would step into our world, receive all of our hostility and anger and hatred, and yet die for us. Show us grace that we did not deserve. And so we see the appearance of grace, and then we see the teaching of grace, because it says in verse 12, teaching us. So it's a teacher. Grace is a great teacher. The law is a teacher, but grace is an even more powerful teacher. Because it, grace teaches us that if we deny ungodliness and, we, and the worldly lust, and we live soberly and righteously and godly, that we, this is what we should do in the present age. And so when you think of grace, grace is a teacher. You see, a person who has been taught by grace, they have a, a longing desire to serve the Lord, not out of compulsion, not out of fearfulness that he's going to do something to them and crush them, but out of loyalty and out of love. I spoke about Pearl Harbor a minute ago. One of the, the, my, the great heroes I love to study is, is Admiral Chester Nimitz. Uh, this past week I was in California and I, and I looked up where he was buried and, of course, where he is buried is actually up in, uh, Sandy, in, in San Francisco. And so we weren't able to go up there. But I, I Googled what his tombstone looked like, and I was amazed that Admiral Chester Nimitz's tombstone, if you were to go out to the Naval Air Station and see the, the graves, it looks just like all those tombstones out there, the same height, same size. The only difference is there's five little stars on his tombstone. Same with Admiral Spruance. All these guys, they, they have the same, it's just like everybody else. That's beside the point. After Pearl Harbor, Chester Nimitz was made the commander-in-chief of the Pacific Fleet, and he arrived in Pearl Harbor, and the men who had been on the staff of Admiral Kimmel, who was court-martial, and General Short, who was also court-martial, for, you know, they were considered derelict of duty at Pearl Harbor, that they, they allowed this to happen. Wasn't true, but they were the scapegoats. Well, all these men who were on their staff, when Chester and Nimitz gathered them together, they were all expecting, it's over. Our careers are done. We're finished. They're going to ship us back to the States. We may be court-martialed. At best, we will sit out the war at a desk job or watching as civilians. And they were distraught and crushed because they knew that their, their military career was over, they would not be able to contribute to the war effort of getting back at their enemy. And Admiral Nimitz walked in the room and he said, gentlemen, I want you to understand today that I'm not 
asking any of you to leave, but I would like for all of you to remain on my staff because the United States needs you. And no one is losing their job. Unless you want to leave, I'm asking you to stay. And because those men were shown grace, they would have moved heaven and earth for that admiral. And you say, well, where did he get that from? Well, part of it was he was understood grace by being a Lutheran who grew up in Texas. But also, when he was a young midshipman, he was given the command of a, not a ship, it was a small boat. And Admiral Nimitz committed the unpardonable sin of being a naval officer. He grounded his ship. That is a career ender for any naval officer who's in command of a ship. You ground your ship, your career's over. But for some reason, the higher-ups decided, you know, we're, we're not going to kick him out of the academy. We're, we're going to give him another chance. And they showed him grace. And what should have been a career ender for him ended up being what caused him to show grace to these very demoralized group of sailors. He had learned grace as a young man and was able to extend that later on. Grace is a powerful teacher. When you understand grace, it changes your life and transforms you, and it makes you want to serve the Lord Jesus. When you understand what it is he has done for you, you begin to want to serve him with diligence and love and passion and honor. I believe that the reason a lot of our churches are in a mess today is because we, we haven't allowed ourselves to be taught by grace. We don't understand just what it is God has done for us and just what it is that, that he has, has, has brought us into the body of Christ. This is a little book I, I, I've been reading. It's not much to read. It's called I Am a Church Member. And, and it's really a fantastic little book. It's by Tom Rainer. And he talks about what it means just to be a church member. And um, some of his titles, and I just want to give these to you. And it's just a commitment. He asked the reader to, to make a commitment. And a person who's been taught by grace and they, they come into the body of Christ, they have no problem making these commitments. Number one, I will be a functioning church member, which means I'm going to be involved. I, I'm going to be serving. I'm going to be diligent about what the Lord's called me to do because I want to serve him. Number two, I will be a unifying church member, not a gossip not someone causing problems and division, not someone you know, looking for a, for a fight or, or trying to express their opinion and, 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 and cause a ruckus. Number three, I will not let my church be about my preferences and desires. In other words, I, I don't get the right to just bloviate and pontificate about what I think ought to be done. It's not about me. It's about Christ. Number four, I will pray for my church leaders. Number five, I will lead my family to be, a, to be healthy church members. You know, it, it is a sad fact today that many people, many Christians are no longer leading their, their family to be healthy church members. Sadly, we, we, we are seeing an exodus of Christians at a very crucial time in their life. When their kids are, are getting up and becoming active, they say, you know, hey, this is important. It's, it's important for my kids to go do travel ball, for my kids to go do this, and, and this is the only time they're going to get this, and we've got to do these things as a family. And so what we're teaching them is that we can set aside our Christian life for a convenient time for us and then come back once we've done all we want to do and pick it back up again. And that is a lie because you can't do that. Because if you teach your children that, hey, you can go and you can set aside your walk with Christ and your work and calling as a church member, a member of his body, 
They're going to walk away from church and they may come back in 10, 15, 20, 30 years, but they will come back vastly different because they will have come back having spent all of their youthful energy and the best years of their life on themselves, only to give God the scraps and what's left over. We've got to change this because it is, it is becoming an epidemic. That topic came up at, at my, that group this week in California that I met with about, you know, we're just seeing families abandon the, not saying they're not church members, not saying that, that, that they're not Christians, but just saying, you know, it's, hey, we've, we've got important things to do. We, we've, we've got to go do some things, and our kids need to do this, and they're going to be involved in that and do this over here. And occasionally we'll come to church, but church kind of gets in the way. And that's a dangerous, dangerous message to be teaching our young people. So I will lead my family to be healthy church members. And the last one, I will treasure, I will treasure church membership as a gift. Now that's not like a country club membership. It's a membership in the body of Christ. To be included in the bride of Christ. What a privilege. What an awesome responsibility as well. And so we are taught by grace to live soberly, to, 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 to be serious-minded with our faith, but also to live righteously, having a sense of, of right and wrong. Columnist that he's long dead, Joe Bailey, he, he interviewed a couple of gentlemen who had been Nazi officers. And they were Christians and had been Christians whenever they were Nazi officers. And, and they were both in line for promotion and to be promoted, they had to join the officers club and, and they refused because they knew if they joined the officers club, it meant drinking and immorality. That was expected. You just had to do it. Everybody did. And so they refused to do that. And so subsequently, they were put as guards in one of the death camps. And while these men took a great stand of saying, we will not participate in immoral behavior, they stood by idly and watched as thousands were executed and did nothing about it and did not raise any objections. And this col columnist wrote about how he was amazed that they were, they were so passionate about their faith in one way, but when it came to mass murder, their patriotism seemed to supersede their, their Christianity. And so we, we're taught to live soberly, but also righteously. And righteousness is not something we get to pick and choose. Righteousness is an objective standard that God sets. And we must take a stand for righteousness. And then also, we must live godly godly in this present age. And that is living with a sense of relationship to God. I was talking to some folks who, in their church, they've, they've started this practice in their committee meetings to where they, they, will, they will take an empty chair and set aside, and they, they call it the Jesus chair. And, and they, they tell the committee members, okay, before we start business, Understand, we, this chair symbolically represents that Christ is in this meeting. It has revolutionized how their meetings go. That the people have an understanding that Christ is actually in the meeting. This is not just about business and you know, going through rows and columns on a spreadsheet or, or taking a vote on what I think. It, this is serious spiritual business because Christ, his presence is there. We need to live in the light and understanding that the Lord Jesus is with us. The Holy Spirit is in us. That this is not the only place we encounter him, that we can walk out and live how we want to live, and we can go do our things that we want to do, and, and we'll come back to the presence of God the next Sunday. To live godly is to live with the understanding that God is always around us, that the Holy Spirit inhabits us, and he can be easily grieved by our actions and attitudes. So if we're, if we're going to understand grace, 
We must realize it, it has appeared to, to us, but it is a great teacher as well. And then verse, th- for verse 13 shows us the focus of grace, the focus of grace, looking for the blessed hope, and that is the return of Christ, and the glorious, and there's the same word, appearing, epiphaneo, of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, that we must live understanding that at any moment our Lord could come. You know, when you live believing that you could be called into account, it changes you. But if you think, ah, the boss is never going to come back, mom and dad is not going to show up, when there's no accountability, we, we tend to, because we're sinful, we tend to live a different way. We must understand that there is an account, accountability in our lives and that Christ could return at any moment and he has called us to be faithful. He has called us to be longing for his appearance. Far too often we lose our focus. We almost live as if hoping that Christ won't come back until we've done certain things or we've been satisfied in certain ways or accomplished certain things and then come back and, you know, when, I, when I'm, you know, in my twilight years, okay, Lord, then come. But right now, just wait. You know, i got some things I want to do. We've lost focus. Christians lose focus. Churches lose focus. The same guy, Tom Rainer, his, his, the Lifeway group did a study of, of churches they called um, inwardly focused churches, which is a euphemism for saying dead churches. And so they surveyed these dead churches uh, as to what was the problem, why they were not growing, and, and they found mostly they were serving themselves and they were not going outside the walls of the church to serve others and, and take the gospel. And th- they found 10 characteristics in these churches. Number one, they found worship wars. Order of service was important. Certain instruments were required while others were prohibited. They found, number two, prolonged minutia meetings. When I tell people that Olive Baptist Church, that our business session is once a quarter and it usually lasts no more than 10 minutes, people are amazed. Well, you know, part of that is because of the immense trust that has been built up through the years of having godly leadership in this church on a lay level and a staff level as well, that we can can do that. There's a lot of churches, they'll meet every month and they will take an hour or two hours to talk about you know, why are we spending that much on the toilet paper and all? I mean, just you name it. And it's just minutia and details. Their facility focus, the iconic status that they have is important. They're program driven, programs are maintained, even if they're irrelevant. Inwardly focused budget. Evangelism and missions are nowhere even close to being at the top of their budget. An inordinate inordinate demand for pastoral care. I want to read his quote on this one. Unreasonable expectations for pastoral attention on even minor matters. Some members expect regular pastoral staff attention merely because they have membership status. Number seven, attitudes of entitlement. Demanding and having a sense of deserving special treatment. Number eight, greater concern over change than over the gospel. Change. They moved my Sunday school class. They put a new podium in there. They're not wearing choir robes anymore. Not even concerned about the lost people. Not even concerned about missions and reaching the down and out and those who have needs and and carrying the gospel to the the hurting and and the needy and the lost. And then number nine, anger and hostility. Members frequently vent hostility toward the church staff and other members. And then number 10, evangelistic apathy. Most members are more concerned with their own needs than sharing their faith, which meets the spiritual needs of the lost around them. You can say, well, thank goodness that's not all of Baptist Church. But I want to tell you something. That can be any of us, and that could easily become our church if we lose our focus. It can. If we stop longing for the appearing 
of Jesus Christ, if we stop believing that we will be called into account for how we live, if we, if we start focusing on ourselves and the things around us and all the accoutrements of, quote, church membership, we can become just like that. It can happen to us, and we must guard against that in our own hearts. And when we see it happening in our church, we must go and pray and confront and rebuke and exhort and lift up and encourage because this can happen to any church because we get our focus off of the grace of Christ. And then number four, and lastly, we see the result of grace. The result is he who gave himself for us. Listen to this. This is an unbelievable statement that Christ would do this for people who are hostile and vicious toward him and wanted nothing to do with him whatsoever. He gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Zealous because of the grace that he's shown, that he would do such a thing, that he would come and bankrupt heaven into himself and come and take on the form of a servant to die for us. It is astounding what Christ did for us. And so the result of grace is that we begin to understand, and we fully don't comprehend this, our worth. Christ would do this for any individual here and for the whole world. He would give himself for us, that he would redeem us from wickedness. People who were at war with him and said, we don't want you. We don't need you. He would still come and pay the price to redeem us out of sinfulness and that he would purify us, cleanse us, so we might have a relationship with him. You know, purity is, is a beautiful thing. And, and oftentimes, we, we don't know just how filthy we are until we've been cleaned up. I don't know if you've ever worked out in the yard and, you know, you go to the shower and all of a sudden you see, you know, dirt and all kind of, it's like, man, I was, that was nasty. And it, it's not until we've embraced the grace of the Lord and we've submitted ourselves to him and we begin to see the filthiness of sin running off of us that we realize just how far down we had gone and how depraved and corrupt we had become. I'll tell you something else too. The closer you get to Jesus as a Christian, the more you realize how sinful you can be. Because the closer you get to his purity and you begin to check your attitudes that you have, even as a Christian, and you begin to, to look at the things you think and say and things you've done, you begin to realize, I, 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 am, I am still so far that it's only by his grace that I have any purity at all. We begin to understand our worth, but also we, we, we are given a special identity, his own special people. I mean, for a Christian, this should mean something to us. Not that we're elite or we're the select or we're the elect or the chosen, frozen, or anything. No, that, that he's allowed us to be a part of his body. People who didn't deserve it. He's opened that door, and he's opened it for all people, all who would say yes to his grace. And they are zealous for good works. Because of grace, there's this passion to serve him. Not looking for excuses why we don't do what God calls us to do, but finding ways to serve him. See, if we understand our our standing and his grace, we, we will begin to serve him with passion. I, I want to end with something I read from Chuck Swindoll, and he uses the example of being a sports fan. And I'm just going to read this to you and, and, and give you a list of some things here, so bear with me. True sports fans have an amazing ability to remember details, statistics, 
little technicalities of rules and stuff that nobody really cares to hear about except other sports fans. Other characteristics of a fan is their indomitable sense of commitment and determination. Against incredible odds, sound logic, and even medical advice, sports fans will persevere to the dying end. I've often wondered what would happen if people were as intense, committed, and determined about church as they are to sports or any number of other pastimes. This, he writes, was reinforced by an article that he had had read about excuses that people might use for quitting sports. And here's the excuses. If you're just going, I'm going to give up sports. I'm tired of this. I, and and what, would, what would be your excuse? I think you'll get the analogy here. Every time I went and watched, they asked me for money. Been to a ballpark lately? The people with whom I sat with didn't seem very friendly. They may have been for the opposite team. They may have spilled their beer on you and blamed you for it. The seats were too hard and uncomfortable. Now, I don't know if you've been to a, a, like a baseball park, but they're some of the most uncomfortable seats imaginable. But you can't keep people away. The owner and the coach never came to see me. The referee or the umpire made a decision with which I could not agree, and therefore I'm going to quit. I'm not going to go to sports anymore. I was sitting with some hypocrites. They only came to see what other people were wearing. They didn't care about sports. I'm not going to go back. Some games went into overtime and, it was, and I was late getting home. The band played music I had never heard before. The games are scheduled when I want to do other things. My parents forced me to go to games when I was growing up. <laughs> Since I've read books on sports, I feel I know more than the coaches and players know anyhow. I don't want to take my children because I want them to choose for themselves what sports they like best. Now that's absurd because no sports fan would ever say anything like that. And I don't want to, you know, drive a thumbtack with a sledgehammer here, but you understand as Christians, we, we should be just as passionate about our relationship with Christ and our standing in the body of Christ as we are. Nothing in our lives should eclipse that and, and, and be bigger than our relationship with Jesus. And so we understand his grace. We understand our worth and our special identity, but we're also zealous for good works. I want to conclude by reading another verse where we see the same word of appearing, and it's just down the page in the third chapter. The third verse, for we ourselves were once foolish, and Paul takes us back in time personally to where we once were disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward mankind appeared, not by works of righteousness, not because we deserved it, not because we were good people, which we have done, but according to His mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want to affirm constantly, that those who have been who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to all people. Well, the conclusion is very simple. Has he saved you? If you have not known his grace and salvation, you can tonight. Very simple. You come forward 
We're going to let you talk to a person. They'll sit down with you, answer your questions, walk you through the gospel, help you understand the, the gift of grace that the Lord Jesus offers to you. And, and the second thing is, for us believers, have we been careful to maintain good works? Have we been diligent to do what we've been called to? Have we responded to the grace that has been poured out upon us? If not, then this ought to be a time of recommitment for, for every believer to say, Lord, I, I want to recommit myself unto you and unto your service because of what you've done for me, because of your love for me. I don't want to ever take that for granted. I, I want to respond to your grace and your mercy and I want to be loyal and be seen as a faithful servant, always looking for your appearing.